Hello, everybody. We are experiencing some technical difficulties with the sound, but we're working to fix that immediately. Please stand by while we get this sorted out. Thank you. Thank uh, for the introduction and thank you MHCC for having us. Um, so I guess before Bryce and I begin, I, I want to kind of set the context with a bit of a, a scenario. You're at work and one of your employees arrives late. You notice his eyes are red, he seems to be fumbling with sitting down and getting settled in. After he begins work, you walk over to check on him. He seems distracted and he really doesn't want to talk to you. So you immediately think he might be high on cannabis, but he might not be. So today, uh, my colleague Bryce and I, we're going to try to provide you some research and some helpful background insights into um, developing policies to address substance use in the workplace, and more broadly, impairment. Uh, we're going to talk primarily about some of the policy components you need to have when considering developing your policy, and we'll finish off with talking a little bit about cannabis, because we know that's a topic of interest for a lot of people, and we're also going to provide you some resources. For those of you who are not familiar with CCSA, just to let you know, um, we are we were created by an act of parliament by the government of Canada. And we're, our main role is to provide national leadership to address substance use and addiction issues. Just to be clear, we are a nonprofit organization. We are not a government organization. And we provide evidence-based research and tools and resources for people in the industry or for practitioners or for the public, depending on where there is a need. I'm going to skip to the other side to just talk about who we are as an organization and let Bryce take over for me. Thanks, Hi, I'm Sandra for uh, introducing us. My name is Bryce Barker. I'm a knowledge broker at CCSA. I'm very happy to be here to talk about this important area. As everybody on the call will be aware, substance use is, is very pervasive. Um, it's a part of our society. People use substances for a variety of different reasons. Those include recreation, for medical treatment, and in some cases as a result of addictions. So the use of substances can uh, lead to impairment that does affect the workplace. So as a result of this potential for impairment that affects the workplace, we've heard from a number of organizations who are concerned, especially with the legalization of cannabis, um, that there's a need to uh, provide some guidance, some research to look into this area. So we've been very happy to work with organizations and to develop some resources in this area. We'll, we'll provide some resources at the end of our, our talk, so you'll be able to see those again. Um, one of the main things that your organization can do is, is develop a, a strong policy and approach that really addresses substance use. And so in our work, we had the opportunity to look into uh, research in this area and what we found were a number of things. So first, that there's minimal research on substance use in the workplace. So it really just doesn't exist um, in there's no literature that, that currently covers this. When Shauna led some research um, and looked at publicly available substance use policies, what we found when we looked at over 800 organizations policies that were publicly available, there were very few that even had um, cursory small policy statement. And when we look for comprehensive substance use policies, we only found 15 out of those 800. So that led us to conclude that there's really a lack of substances, substance use policies that exist and ones that are comprehensive and, and cover an organization um, from some of the risks and impacts from substance use that we will cover. So in the literature, what we found was an absence of review and evaluation of the policies. So those would be really important to understand if 
your current policy is effective and if it's actually doing what you hoped it would do in terms of um, potentially enforcement of, of discipline, but also supporting um, people to, to seek treatment and, and get the help that they need. But lastly, in terms of lost productivity to businesses, um, our organization, CCSA, worked with the Canadian Institute on Substance Use Research and was really looking into the cost of lost productivity to businesses that can be attributed to substance use. And what we found was that this was $15.7 billion. So this is a really substantial sort of bottom line impact from substances. But in this work, we also found that there are a number of other areas of impact on organizations. So these can, can affect the individual, they can affect the organization, they can affect people's families, um, and they can have an effect on, on the public at large. So the impacts include absenteeism and, and presenteeism. So absenteeism is simply not being able to, to show up to work. Presenteeism is, is slightly different in that someone is able to come to work, they are physically present, but they're not able to, to do their work in the way they would otherwise. So substances are impacting their ability to do their job. So that relates to cognitive impairments. Um, you know, really thinking just specifically about alcohol, you can imagine if someone is impaired from alcohol, what types of cognitive impairments they would have on the job. So those might be judgment, those might be the ability to, to do things such as operate a, a motorized vehicle, so especially really important in um, safety sensitive industries. Chronic diseases, so to continue with alcohol, um, a number of chronic diseases are related to alcohol use. So that, those would be things like cirrhosis of the liver, cancers caused by alcohol, um, diabetes, and a number of other chronic diseases are negatively affected by alcohol. So employee morale, you can imagine that if someone or a number of people are impaired in the workplace, how this can have an impact on employee morale in general. I'll, I'll loop back to this when we talk about negative work environment. So injuries, accidents, fatalities, and legal impact from substance use are really the, um, the more extreme end of the impact. And they are unfortunate, but they do remind us that these impacts can happen in the workplace and they might affect an employee directly. They might affect their, their family. So that could be something that is happening to not an employee directly in their workplace, but in their family or social circle. And also injuries, accidents, fatalities can affect the public in specific industries. And so it come really tightly into focus for people in safety sensitive industries like transportation. So there are some specific work related risk factors that can contribute to substance use and substance use that affects the workplace. So first, access to alcohol and drugs. As you can imagine, if you're in an industry like the service industry where I have access to um, alcohol and, and maybe now cannabis, how that could potentially affect um, how I interact with substances. And I'll skip to the last point just to say, you might have access to alcohol through your, your type of work, but your job specifically might involve meeting with clients, um, going to receptions. You can imagine within one organization, some, some specific um, positions would include those types of responsibilities, so therefore might contribute to your substance use. So a high stress and a negative work environment so you can imagine that people can use substances to cope and they're more likely to use substances to cope in, in situations where there's high stress or where there's a negative work environment. And to loop back to morale, so you can imagine how if someone is using substances to cope with a negative work environment, how that can further erode the work environment itself. So these next three I'll take together, uh, repetitive duties, shift work and fatigue. So you can imagine a number of industries that um, there could be heavy physical labor, um, there could be shift work where someone is working evenings or working overnight, and how that would relate to fatigue. Uh, a lot of people are really familiar with how fatigue can, can lend itself to making poor health-related decisions, and that is, of course, uh, true when it comes to substances as well. We wanted to ask everybody who was able to join us today um, about which type of employee impairment concerns you the most. 
So we've laid out a few options for you. Stress, alcohol use, lack of sleep, cannabis use, mental health and well-being. We can see the poll results coming in and I'll look to Anna and Sandra and Karina just for an indication that we can move on. So neck and neck, um, we could see the numbers coming in. Um, the first most important one, not surprisingly from this group, is mental health and well-being. Um, so that came in at 74.2% of, of the replies. Um, the rest just edged out cannabis use, 27.1%. And um, then, then we saw cannabis use, uh, alcohol use, and lack of sleep rounded out the list. So we'll revisit this as we go through, but um, this does feed into our next slide around where cannabis policy sits within an overall fitness for duty or fit for duty or impairment focused policy. So cannabis is an important part of the policy um, and an important part of thinking through what impairment looks like at your organization. But as you can see from this slide, there's a number of other areas, a number of other areas of other substances, but non-substance related causes of impairment. So those can include stress, lack of sleep, workplace conditions, distractions, personal or family crisis, fatigue, and mental health concerns that might contribute to someone being impaired. So Shauna brought up um, an example, a story about um, someone coming into work and seemingly being impaired. And if that had happened maybe around the time where cannabis became legal, maybe your first thought would be that this is related to cannabis. But maybe upon further consideration, you think about this employee's circumstances and they may be a new parent um, and they might have mentioned in the past that they have a lot more stress at home and a lack of sleep. And so this might be contributing to their impairment. Um, that doesn't necessarily rule out you know, other factors that might be at play. There might be workplace stress. Um, there could be mental health involved. But you can see how if that was the profile, you might have different options for supporting someone through a policy. But you still might need to talk about their impaired ability to do their job. So as Bryce mentioned earlier, uh, from our experience, we found that most businesses do not have a policy to address impairment, fitness for duty, or substance use, and the workplace types of issues. So the next few slides, and the majority of the rest of our presentation, we're going to talk about what types of policy components uh, businesses should be considering when they're developing a fit for duty policy. One of the things we'd like to state up front is it really is going to depend quite a bit on what type of industry you're in. Uh, so keeping in mind what works for an office environment might not work for a, you know, a restaurant environment, which may be different for a hospital or for an airline. So just being cognizant of the fact that this is kind of a general recommendation. So when we talk about what should be in a policy, um, as we mentioned, there really isn't tons of research in this area, but it is coming along. But when we looked at it, we found that there were generally eight components of a really well-developed comprehensive policy. Uh, first, there's objectives and scope. So employees need to know what their expectations are. Um, prevention, which talks about education and informing and training your management. Another important component to a policy is observation and investigation. Uh, so how do you detect impairment? What are you looking for? And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Policies should also address support. So they shouldn't all be about um, disciplining the employee. There should be support mechanisms in there. A really good policy will also address return to work and return to duty, which is part of accommodation. We'll also talk about that a bit. And again, policies, just again, they have to be clear about what's going to happen to them if they're not compliant with the policy. So those types of uh, clarifications right up front need to be there. We found that almost no one seemed to review or evaluate their policies. And we mean more, like not just for being current, but also for being effective. 
there's really no point in, in establishing a policy if it's not doing what you want it to do. And the last thing is uh, these types of policies, when we're talking about substance use and impairment, they have to meet legal requirements. And we're also going to talk a little bit about some of the legal requirements in Canada. So first off, when you're considering developing a policy, uh, when you're talking about substance use, there's a few things to take into mind. So when it comes to addressing substances, um, you know, employees need to know what the rules are. Is alcohol allowed or are they not allowed? What, the, you know, what is going to constitute um, impairment by a prescription or by, the, a, you know, a, a cold medication? So when we're talking about impairment, we're talking about more than just somebody who might be affected by substance use disorder. We're talking about people who could be using uh, a prescription incorrectly or maybe they're using illicit drugs. So there's lots of different things to be considering when you're talking about substance use policy. Language in the policy really matters. Um, from our perspective, using the term substance use is really important as opposed to abuse or misuse. Um, the, the last two words, misuse and abuse, tend to have a very derogatory connotation to them. So if somebody in your organization uh, is really affected by a substance use disorder and they see that in their policy, they may feel targeted by the policy rather than um, seeing it as a supportive measure. The other thing about using the terms misuse and abuse is they're a little bit uh, unclear. So if you have an employee who maybe went out partying the night before, they're not somebody who drinks all the time, but they came in hung over the next morning, for them, misuse and abuse might not be entering their mind. They might not think of that as something that's affecting their work environment. So generally speaking, we recommend the term substance use um, because it could apply to all sorts of contexts. The one exception here is considering um, insurance company requirements. So most insurance companies, um, they will have some specific language they'll want you to use when it comes to supporting someone with a substance use disorder. And so if you're developing your policy, when it talks, to, when you're starting to talk about supports and healthcare and um, employee assistance programs, you're going to want to have your insurance company weigh in on the kind of language that um, they feel is appropriate for their, uh, to offer their services. The last thing that we think was really important when considering a substance use policy is making sure that you include the prevention, education, and training. Um, it's a lot easier to handle uh, a substance use issue if you already put in place ways to prevent it, if people are educated about what it looks like. And because most of the time it's not going to be your managers and supervisors who notice in, um, impairment, it's going to be the peers, the coworkers. So when it comes to making this aspect of your policy, we recommend you consult um, specifically a medical professional with a specialization in addictions, and if you can find one, who also has a specialization in occupational health and safety. That kind of combination will give you a person who knows how to frame your policy in terms of what the effects of impairment will be. Uh, and if they also have the health and safety aspect, they can also look at your organization to see where the risks are. Um, if you're in an office environment, the risk might not be high. But if you're in any kind of safety sensitive environment, you might have specific risks that are really important to you. Question we get asked a lot about is how do you observe for impairment? You know, what's, what are we supposed to be looking for and, and, and how do we deal with it? As I mentioned before, it's going to be different for every organization. Safety sensitive organizations are going to have a really high risk um, environment. So you're going to want to probably deal with, the, um, with an, a, an impairment problem right away. But still, um, when it comes to observation, uh, the first thing is, is are you really looking for changes in employees' behavior, their productivity, or their physical appearances? You're looking for changes in them that are different from their norm. So behavior might be they suddenly become an introvert or the opposite, they suddenly become an extrovert. Maybe their productivity declines quite a bit. Um, but there are also cases where their productivity might increase, but the quality of the product is, is no longer good. Maybe they're making mistakes, they're errors. Physical changes in people also suffering from impairment. And again, this is not just substance use, this is any type of impairment. You can see weight loss, weight gain. You might see changes in their skin color, um, changes in their eyes. So again, there's a lot of different clues to tell you that maybe something has changed in someone's life. 
And again, this is where you're going to seek the advice of a medical professional to help you develop your policy for what that may look like. The other thing we get asked is how do you approach the employee? So there's not, again, a lot of research on this, but we've looked at a number of policies that have laid out what to do with um, approaching an employee. And they generally include some of these. So first of all, you need to take the employee out of um, a high risk situation if they are in one. Um, put, bring them to a place where you can have a private and confidential conversation with them. This shouldn't obviously be taking place in front of other employees. We do notice that a lot of employers choose to have two um, people in the room with the employee. And, and that's mostly for verification and also um, just ensuring that the employee is getting a fair uh, conversation and to have two opinions on the, on the matter. Um, if the employee is impaired, we recommend that you develop a policy on how to get them home or to get medical attention. Um, it shouldn't be, you, most lawyers will probably tell you that you are responsible for them if they are impaired and not letting them go just to drive or to operate any other type of machinery. Um, your talk with the employee, again, is it's a, it's a discussion. It's not an interrogation. You're really just trying to find out you know, what's going on or there's some things in your life. And you have to pick the right personnel in your organization who are equipped to do this. So it might be your human resources personnel or it might be a really trusted individual in your organization. Um, you also need to develop a procedure on how your coworkers can identify and report a suspected impairment because as I mentioned before more likely your co-workers are going to the co-workers of the employee are going to pick up on it sooner than a manager or supervisor. The point about leave the diagnosis to the experts we do have a lot of employers who feel that they're supposed to diagnose the issue but we want to take that responsibility away from you that that's not up to you that's really up to the medical experts. All you need to do is identify that there's an issue and then make sure that person sees the right personnel for a proper diagnosis. Because it's going to be really difficult for anyone to tell the difference between someone who might be having a reaction to a diabetic shock versus somebody who might be um, using alcohol. So leave it up to the experts. Testing, there's a lot to be said about testing. It's a highly sensitive um, topic in Canada. Uh, it's a whole other discussion that we don't really have time to get into. My one piece of advice here is that really the only place that there's a, a potential need for testing will be in a safety sensitive industry. If, you, if you're not in a safety sensitive industry, you, you shouldn't really need to be considering testing. It's, it's not really considered the right environment for from a human rights perspective. So in terms of consultations for talking about observation, uh, we recommend that employers consult with medical professionals, again, with a specialization in addictions. It's also really useful to talk with people who are lived and lived experience. So these are people who have either gone through an addiction or are experiencing it. They're going to have some good insights. Um, you also want to talk to some prevention experts and potentially some lawyers. Okay. Organizational culture aspect. So first, in the research that uh, Shauna led and our engagement with partners, we heard repeatedly that culture is crucial, but can also be a real barrier to addressing impairment and substance use. Um, specifically, so we at CCSA do a lot of work around st stigma and substance use. So stigma can really contribute to someone being very hesitant to seek out the help that they need. Um, so policies and approaches in this area should definitely attempt to, at the very least, make sure that there's no possibility for discrimination, um, making that a part of the explicit conversation. But it might be a bit more aspirational to eliminate stigma in the workplace. But this really does relate back to prevention, education, and training. But there needs to be a concerted effort to discuss stigma and substance use and to, to make sure that that stigma is not a barrier. So again, outright discrimination is obviously a barrier and should be a real policy consideration, but stigma itself can also get in the way of people seeking the support they need. So balancing support measures and disciplinary measures, so as Shauna mentioned, um, what we found in the research that we did was a lot of policies and policy statements really gave detail on disciplinary measures 
um, and you know, prohibition of being impaired at work, which is obviously very important. But there needs to be also a balance of support for, for employees so that they know that they can seek support and that their workplace can help them to get the support that they need. And Shauna mentioned this already briefly in relation to coworkers um, might notice that someone's impaired. Um, so the real, there's an opportunity in workplaces and the emerging literature seems to show that peer-to-peer -peer programs are a good idea. And in a way, we can, it makes sense that a peer would feel more comfortable speaking, again, colleagues feel more comfortable speaking to each other about an issue. And a colleague might be able to help shepherd a person towards the supportive measures that they need within the organization. Um, the, all the literature and, and best guidance in this area that we found really showed it that it's important to consult with employees, obviously human resources, to make sure that any potential policy changes or training, education, prevention um, is, is the best that's available. Uh, unions, if they are applicable in your field, um, and experts or policy experts, you might want to reach out to a policy expert to make sure that your policy fits your context. So in the last slide, we, we touched on, on balance. Um, and from what we've seen in, in the legal perspectives on this work is that there's a need for balance, um, really balancing in a number of areas. So first of all, it's the employer duty to provide a safe working environment, but it's also another duty to respect human rights. So sometimes those can, can dovetail well, sometimes they seem to work against each other, but the legal considerations in this area are such that you need to be able to balance both of those. You cannot uh, violate anyone's human rights. So again, that balance of employer needs, and again, the employer needs might be more around enforcement, detection, disciplinary measures, and those are important, but there needs to be a balance with employee needs, and that does become a legal consideration in, in some decisions of, of a legal nature. Substance dependence of so use disorders, substance use disorders are a disability um, and are recognized as such. So again, discriminating someone as a disability is, is a violation of their human rights. And so it's obviously a, an important human rights consideration. Accommodation up to undue hardship is the expectation under the law as it relates to substance use dependence, substance use disorders. Um, accommodation, so what that exactly means in different workplaces um, will be variable. And what undue hardship, so undue hardship meaning that um, beyond a point beyond which it's unreasonable to expect the employer to make changes to the work environment. So uh, in some cases that might mean making a new job in an industry where there's just not jobs that would that would work. So again, not to be too specific, but as, a, as an example, there might be considerations for undue hardship in specific industries that look very different for other industries or, or for office jobs, as Shauna mentioned earlier. Um, so in this area for legal considerations and legal aspects of a policy, it's, it's obviously crucial to, to work with a lawyer, but also a human rights expert. So again, you'll, you'll need to make sure that your organization is covered, but also that you're not violating human rights by, by what you're laying out in policy and that potential approaches to addressing it. All right, so cannabis tends to be a hot topic these days, so um, we thought we'd touch on it as much as we can. We could probably have whole discussions on this alone. But, so first of all, it's, it's obviously a new area for everyone. Canada is the test case for the legalization aspect. And what this means is, I mean, in all honesty, it's going to take years to find out what the true impact is. We're not going to know in the next couple of years. It takes a while for this kind of, um, whenever you make such a substantial change to an entire country, uh, that kind of change is going to take time to see what it's going to look like. So what you see now might not be what you see in a couple of years. Outside of that, alcohol is still the most used substance in Canada and presents the highest cost to society. So just to put this in perspective, in 2017, um, a national study, uh, there's a study that's conducted every year in 2017, 78% of Canadians reported using alcohol, 15% that's one five reported using cannabis. 
So the discrepancy between the two is still quite large. Of course, that may change with legalization, but it's just to put in perspective that when you're seeing impairment in the workplace, it could come from all different kinds of places. And this doesn't take into consideration the stress that people feel, mental health issues, those types of things. Another thing to keep in mind is the quality of research and information on cannabis varies greatly. There is an ongoing kind of comment in, at least amongst the research industry, that if you want to find a study that supports your view on cannabis, right now you can. It's just they are all over the place. And it's partly because it's such a new area. It's partly because studies are being conducted on in so different ways, so many different ways and different populations. Some studies might not be done as rigorously, and some studies might be being conducted by um, organizations that might have a bias in terms of what they want to present uh, in terms of findings. Um, so this is really important to keep that in mind that when you're hearing information out there, not everything is solidly known, even if it comes across that way. It's really important to kind of just question the source of the research. We get asked a lot about medical versus recreational use. So in the workplace environment, there's two things that really kind of stick out for us in terms of how to consider this. First of all, in terms of policy, most organizations we've seen have treated recreational use um, like alcohol, so um, it, it's not allowed on the premises uh, or to be done at work. And most organizations we've seen have treated medical use as any other type of medical medication that someone can take that could potentially cause impairment. Um, just because you have medical, um, if somebody's taking a medical authorized uh, cannabis, it doesn't mean they're allowed to be impaired at work. Workplaces still have a legal responsibility to have a safe workplace. So um, there is that kind of variation. And again, this is a new area, so um, it's, it's not a place where any hard decisions have been made, but that's kind of what we've been seeing between medical and recreational. The other thing to keep in mind with medical and recreational is um, medical use cannabis is still really a new area. And even the physicians who are authorizing it, they um, not all of them may know how to authorize it properly. They may be, so there's two components to cannabis that, and there's a medical component and a component that compares you or a component that considers you as considered medical. We don't have enough information yet. There's still a lot of uh, um, research going on to determine whether or not the medical component has any medical properties and whether or not um, it has any impairing effects. But that aside, some Physicians may not know how to authorize it properly and may authorize something with too high of the impairing content, the THC. So if you want to know more about medical versus recreational, again, this is a good place to talk to your substance use uh, medical professional. And the last point to talk about is commercialization. And this kind of goes back to the research question I was talking about. When you're hearing information, when you're hearing presentations, when you're hearing um, from different uh, people in the industry and, and from different industries. Keep in mind that some people are going to be coming with a pro-cannabis, pro-health um, effects, pro-lens, um, and some people are going to be coming with a, a kind of a fear-mongering, like you need to be afraid of it, you need to worry. And they're both going to have their points of view. Um, we're a research organization. We base our uh, information on evidence, so we can't, we don't try to travel down I either of those roads. We just recommend that as an employer, if you're looking for information, if you're looking for um, reliable sources, just consider who's providing the information to you. So um, some of it is commercialized and it sometimes it's disguised as not commercialized. So just, just always ask the question. You just never know who you're going to be um, getting your information from. So we wanted to ask a second poll question of everybody who was able to join today. Um, how comfortable do you feel with your organization's current policy to effectively address impairment? The options are very comfortable, somewhat comfortable, neutral, somewhat uncomfortable, and very uncomfortable. So uh, we'll get everybody's uh, take. We'll give you just a few seconds, and then we'll, we'll come back. So um, it looks like 
most of the people joining the call are somewhat comfortable, and you know, this is probably a relatively high achieving group uh, to join something on this uh, on this topic and be regular subscribers to this series of webinars considering mental health in the workplace. Um, so, which is a good sign. We're we're actually really happy to hear that. Um, you know, we, we hope that we've been able to to add to your understanding, and if you're considering uh, furthering furthering your work in this area, that information we provided would be helpful. Um, next. So we we wanted to provide some resources. Um, so there are, as Shauna mentioned, you know, we're uh, not for profit and, you know, we, we really try to stick with the research. And there are a number of other organizations that really do try to stick with the, the research and are reputable in this area. Um, so we wanted to share some of the resources that we've highlighted uh, that could help you develop your approach to this work. Of course, we want to draw your attention to our reports at CCSA. They include reports and resources on workplace, uh, resources regarding alcohol, cannabis, and stigma. Um, you can also find the cost study where we talked about um, lost productivity. It's on our website as well. We wanted to draw your attention to the Atlantic Canada Council on Addiction Guide. Uh, that's a useful guide for developing policy. And we also wanted to draw your attention to the Canadian Centre for Occupational Health and Safety. Their course on impairment um, is, a, is a deeper dive into this area of impairment and, and thinking about an impairment focused policy. And the resources should be in the, um, the window, the webinar window. You should be able to scroll down and, and get it right now as a PDF, I believe. I can see it in the top right, but you, it might be different on your window. Um, so lastly, we wanted to uh, thank our host, MHCC. We want to thank everybody who took the time to join us today. And um, we really do appreciate your time. And we think this is an important topic and an important area and one that has continued um, relevance for our foreign players. So thanks so much. And we'll transition to questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, all your time is working really well. And um, Aspects that we discuss um, on an ongoing basis, of course, related to stigma, as well as um, reminding people that as much as it's about awareness and providing um, appropriate support, we're not medical professionals, and, and not to feel that you know we should be diagnosing or, or going kind of beyond our um, our roles within the organization, which I think is important, um, as well as just building on that awareness piece um, and creating that safe space so that it's not about judgment and bias and I think that's connected to the stigma too. I think it's important, um, you know, certainly when we talk about um, substance use as well as mental health and knowing that so often they do go hand in hand, I think is also um, just really important. So thank you again for that. Um, so with that, we will turn to some questions. Uh, we have. We have quite a few that were provided during the um, registration and some that are popping up now. You can also, um, if you're not aware, submit questions in the Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen and um, we're able to get through a few today. Um, one that was um, noticed earlier that I don't think was directly covered in the presentation is if you could speak a little bit to um, the idea of zero tolerance in, in the role that that plays and perhaps that's more from the safety sensitive um, sector, but is there any comments you can have on that? Well, I guess just to kind of clarify, to zero tolerance in terms of um, that you won't tolerate impairment or that you won't tolerate substances being used. That's a tough one in terms of what's realistic and in terms of maybe the message it conveys um, is that there's nothing wrong with having it in terms of you, you don't want to tolerate any type of impairment in the workplace, but how you frame that in the workplace uh, and how the language you use around it could go one way or the other. It could turn people off if they don't understand um, the reasoning behind it or what is meant by it. So if you're, if especially if you're a safety sensitive organization which has a zero tolerance policy, you just have to be very clear what that means, and you have to be very clear about what would be the disciplinary measure if somebody um, crosses that line. So it's it's really about clear communication if you're going to use a zero tolerance policy because it could have some negative backfires on it. So. 
I think another thing, just in the, the context of our presentation, um, you know, someone might not necessarily, so if you had a zero tolerance policy for being impaired, so as in showing up we're under the influence, direct influence of a substance, that might not cover a number of other circumstances where someone is impaired and maybe it is connected to their substance use. So you know, that clarity that Shana was talking about, I think is very, very important that you very clearly define what you mean um, by zero tolerance and you know when and where that applies. Um, and I think that's an important message in all of this too, is it is about it's, uh, supporting employees. Of course, it's about everyone's health and safety, um, but it's also about providing support and getting, um, you know, people towards the help that they they do need, um, which I think is important. And as it's been noted by one of our um, participants, is that there is a fine line between appropriate discipline as well as then discrimination. And so I don't know if that you can speak a little bit more to that, and if there's a way that 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 can be managed. Yeah, well, I, I think I saw that question pop up, and it's an interesting question because sometimes it's about perception as well. Um, you can have a well laid out policy, and it's, it's stay, still may be perceived as discriminatory. Um, so that's where it's really good to talk with people with lived and lived experience to see how they interpret it. Um, but another thing that just occurred to me, and, and I know a legal case was uh, there was a legal case involving this, is when you outline your policy, um, it's really important to also make sure it's implemented properly. Uh, there was a legal case a couple of years ago where the company had a really good policy um, that defined everything without, without the discriminatory nature. Uh, but there was an incident in that company and uh, the manager at the time implemented the policy with poor best, like didn't use best practices. And because of that situation, uh, they didn't find in favor of the company because of the way the policy was implemented. So even though the policy was good, uh, the best practice or the way it was implemented or carried out uh, didn't go very well. So again, consult with those people who have lived in living experience. They're probably going to be the best to detect if something has some type of discriminatory nature, but also be prepared for the fact that you're not going to have a perfect policy. There are going to be people who are going to find it um, offensive just because of the nature or because of where they're at in 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 their like lifestyle, so you, you won't be able to hit on everything. But that's where a good lawyer is uh, very useful. Maybe yeah, I would just take a slightly different tack on that to think about someone who has a, a diagnosed substance use disorder and they're working with a treatment professional and they have a return to work plan. So again, the the bright line between discrimination and appropriate discipline would be their return to work uh, stipulations, your agreement with them, and the one that has been worked on by hopefully a treatment professional so that you would be just working with that agreement in mind and working with the employee with that explicit agreement in mind. So again, it wouldn't be discrimination against someone with a diagnosed substance use disorder if you were keeping within the guidelines of an agreement that was made with an addictions treatment professional. Thank you for that. Um, another important topic that we hear a lot about in uh, from a workplace perspective that you know is also complex depending on sector and, and nature of work, but it's on accommodation. And I know we did talk about that a little bit before, but someone was asking for some more practical examples of what that could look like. And again, I realize it, it can be a whole range of things, and there's obviously also limitations based on the nature of work and sector. But do you have some examples from a substance use perspective? Yeah, like what that could look like. So, uh, accommodation policies are highly tailored to the individual and the, and, and the business. Mm -hmm. So there is no one uh, answer. Yeah. answer. There, are there are some templates out there, though. Uh, we know the use agreement that's out there. Um, you can look at some people's return to work agreements, and uh, they kind of mention mention what to consider an accommodation. You always will need somebody with. Um, a medical professional who knows addiction in order to tell you what that employee can and can't do. So if you're in an office environment, you're usually not at risk for any kind of harms to other individuals, and potential morale maybe. But if you're in a safety sensitive environment, you're going to need that medical professional who can tell you where impairment says you can no longer do this job. So we're going to accommodate you and give you a different role 
or we're going to change your position somehow so that you can continue to work with us, but um, in a different context where if you're going through recovery, um, that it still meets your recovery needs and doesn't uh, put the employer in any kind of um, undue hardship. Having said that, there are some employers who've told us that they haven't been able to do the accommodation piece because of some very specific jobs. If somebody has a very specific role and they can't transition to a different role, um, those are some areas where uh, it, it is challenging and that might involve a broader conversation with the employee, um, with the medical professional, and then just what can be done in that scenario. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things that we, we did see and we've heard about was um, in some situations, so immediate accommodation for a person to receive treatment could be allowing them to go on leave you know, as a specific example. But you know, Shana, I think, is just speaking a lot more to ongoing accommodation for an ongoing issue. So there are different ways to think about accommodation and the time scale, which we're talking about. And TKA, CCFA has provided um, a list of resources that are available to download right now in the file mode. And right now we're showing you a list of potential hospitals in the workplace resources. Um, we at the Commission provide, um, most of you hopefully are already aware of them, but they're there and also available through our website as well. So feel free to check those out. And as always, we do like to know how we did with the session. Um, so there is the evaluation survey that we ask you to complete, and it's just great feedback for us um, moving forward um, with the knowledge exchange work that we um, focus on and provide. And if you're unable to complete the survey immediately following this webinar, a link will also be included in the thank you email that you will receive after the session. And so with that, I just want to thank all of you for joining us today. And of course, a huge thank you to Bryce and Shauna. It's always a pleasure to work with you and hear sort of the latest and greatest that's happening in this ever-evolving, I think, world and, and topic. Um, but it's just great to know, you know, what is available now and, and what employers can and should be doing. Um, knowing that it is a topic that it evolves is also, I think, important to note. And thank you to my colleagues who have set up um, this session as well as um, just dedicated to this series overall. It's um, it's a huge undertaking just to have even a relatively short session take place. So thank you for your, your efforts in that. And I did want to mention that while this has been um, an amazing monthly um, workplace series, um, moving forward uh, with our mandate at the Mental Health Commission of Canada, we'll be moving forward with more of an ad hoc basis for our webinars. So um, definitely stay tuned for any upcoming events and um, we'll be able to reach out when appropriate. But of course, we'll maintain our workplace webinars on the archives where you'll be able to get this session in the next few weeks and all of our previous sessions are also available for you to access. Um, we also have our newsletter so you can subscribe and stay informed of our work that way as well. So with that, I want to thank everyone again and enjoy the rest of your day.